Well, here we are. It is now the season of Lent. We have entered into this season of prayer and fasting and repentance. And that's what I want to look at today. I want to look at repentance. It's a word that has been used too often as a club to get people to do the right thing or something that someone wanted them to do. So I want to look carefully at that word and see the gift that it can be to us as we seek to grow closer to God in Christ. I read earlier this week, I read a beautiful um, uh, definition for the word repent. And this is a quote from Thomas Keating. He says that to repent is to change the direction in which we are looking for happiness. Change the direction in which we are looking for happiness. I find this very helpful. And and I recognize in myself, and I think that it is common to this human experience that we are always looking for happiness. There is a sense that, uh, that, that, that we need more, that there is a lack within us. And the problem is that we tend to look in the wrong places for happiness. To be human is to suffer, to struggle, to grieve. We are, not ha- we are not naturally happy and contented much of the time. There is something we need to be whole and complete, contented or happy. There is an emptiness that we feel inside of us. We feel a lack of at the very core of our being. And that's what we see played out in the story of the garden that we heard this morning. The snake convinces Adam and Eve that the fruit from this forbidden tree is exactly the same shape as that hole in the center of their being. If they eat that fruit, they will be wise and fulfilled and happy. That fruit is beautiful. That's what they need. And they do. They eat the fruit. And what they discover instead is that it has created a gulf between them and God. Theologians call this emptiness that drives us to seek something else, something outside of ourselves usually. They call that emptiness original sin. Like Adam and Eve, we are driven to fill this lack. But too often, the things that we seek, what they give us instead are suffering and contention and conflict and not happiness. In the 17th century, Blaise Pascal, a a famous theologian and and, uh, philosopher, spoke of this lack In his book, Pensees, he writes, What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in humanity a true happiness of which all that is now all that now remains is the empty print and trace? This we try in vain to fill with everything around us, seeking in things that which are not seeking in things that are not there the help we cannot find in those that are, though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only by an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God alone. St. Augustine wrote much, much earlier about the lack at the core of our being in this way. You have made us for yourself And our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. Much more recently, uh, Peter Rollins in his book, The Idolatry of God, drew on the work of psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan to describe this lack 
that we feel, this emptiness, this need in psychological terms. Now, Lacan talks about infants as having two births. There is the, the physical birth from their mother, and then later there is the birth of the individual, the awareness of individuality. And the birth of the individual begins somewhere around 18 months of age with the recognition by the infant that she is separate from the environment around her and even from her mother. Lacan calls this stage, and it takes time to develop, he calls this stage the mirror phase because the infant slowly realizes that the face of her mother that she has gazed on all of her life is not herself, that she is someone separate from that beautiful face that she has gazed upon. And with this realization, Lacan theorizes that there is a sense of loss. The infant feels the loss of that oneness with her mother and a longing to reclaim that oneness now that she knows that she is a separate being. And that longing, in these psychological terms, is what Rollins calls original sin. So however we describe the lack at our core, we know it. And we all expend great efforts trying to fill that lack. And those efforts are so often the very source of sin in our lives. The very things we seek to fill our longing end up creating division between us and others, between us and God. Think about the things that cause suffering in our lives. We chase after happiness, trying to acquire wealth or, or possessions. We long for the love of just the right person, even when we're with someone. We fight for power and control or, or chase after fame and recognition. Now, these are the broad categories of sin in our lives and each of them is rooted in this urgent need to fill that emptiness at the heart of our lives. Now, all of the seeking after happiness leads us to more suffering. That's what we see in the garden. The snake convinces Adam and Eve that the forbidden fruit will fill the emptiness at the core of their being. And when they eat it, what they find is that it's just fruit and now they've done something they weren't supposed to do. They've broken their re agreement, their relationship with God and what they find instead is suffering and isolation. That's the pattern of sin in our lives. We seek after the wrong things in our drive to find happiness. And when we get them, we find that they are no, we are no better off or worse, we, that we have become even more isolated and cut off from the sacred, from God. That's the pattern of sin. That's, and, and that brings us to our gospel reading today. Jesus endures temptation the very temptations that we endure. He feels that lack that we have at the center of our being as human beings. He is, after all, fully human. And he encounters Satan in the wilderness, and they have this intense, concentrated encounter where he endures all the temptations that we endure in life in this short span, in this short encounter. But look at what happens. First, Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And when he was good and hungry, when he was famished, the devil came to him. At his weakest moment, the devil, the Satan came to him and said, Since you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread and eat, and you will no longer be famished. 
But Jesus says no. He says, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from God. And so the, Satan decides to try again and, and takes Jesus to the top of the highest tower of the temple and says, throw yourself down from here since you are the Son of God. And God will send angels to catch you and protect you so that you won't even dash your foot as you float down from this temple. Test God's love and esteem for you. Just jump. You'll see if you are the Son of God. And Jesus says, No, for it is written, You shall not test the Lord your God. But the devil's not done with him. And so he takes him to the top of the highest mountain and shows him all the kingdoms in all of their glory. And he says, you, all of this can be yours if you just bow down and worship me. And at this point, Jesus has had enough. He says, away with you, Satan. Away with you, Satan, For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only God. So look at what's happening here. Look at what Satan offers and how Jesus responds. Satan offers bread. Use your privilege. Use your power as the Son of God. Sate your hunger by turning these stones into bread. Something outside of himself. Use his power to get his own comfort. And then he says, jump from this tower and God will protect you. Worship me and all of this can be yours. Everything he is offering is something outside of Jesus. It is about other people's esteem for Jesus. Other people's belief in Jesus. It's all external. And Jesus, to every single temptation, points back to God. Every time. Even in the garden, we see that same pattern playing out. Adam and Eve believe that this thing outside of them will give them satisfaction. And what they miss is what Jesus teaches us, that that happiness that they crave is found only in God. Original sin is part of the human condition. We all feel the lack at the core of our lives. And the whole world around us is designed to take advantage of that. They will sell you something uh, uh, to, to make you feel better. If you buy this brand of TV, look, they've come out with ultra high definition now. And if you get that and get a really big one and put it on the wall in your apartment, then you will be happy. And if you don't go for that, well, we have some beer here. And this beer will make you beautiful and other people will desire you if you just drink this beer. And if what you're feeling is insecurity, well then, we have just the investment fund for you. Put your money in this retirement instrument and you will be safe and secure all the rest of the days of your life. Um, or even better, this time of year with all of the political ads uh, vote for this candidate and you can share in the power and control of this candidate and the party. Of course, all of that is a lie. The message of the garden and the lesson of the temptation is that the lack, the emptiness that we feel at our core is filled only by God. And the good news is that God is already here and present. God is here with us, in us, among us, here and now. And when we turn inward and look for the presence of God among us, we will find God. We will find the, the reassurance that we seek. The op. It goes back to that definition from Thomas Keating. To look 
for our happiness, not outside of ourselves in things and in, in promises or in the esteem of others or in fame or in power, but to look inward to the loving presence of God in us and for us and through us. So the opportunity of Lent, the season of Lent, the great gift we have as a people in a liturgical church where we observe the season of prayer and fasting and repentance is that this is a time when we can be awakened to those things that we've believed in, that we've sought after outside of ourselves, the things that we chase looking for happiness, and let them go and turn instead to God. God is present here and now in us and for us, among us, and through us for the world. When we look outside of ourselves for happiness, we find separation, suffering, and grief. When we look to God, we find what we need. We can find joy. We can find the sacred within us, among us, and in others. And we can find peace. Peace.